Arizona State's in trouble with the NCAA and the football department. We rank the top three quarterbacks going into the SEC season in 2021. Who's going to win the College World Series? New SEC coaches adjusting to their personnel and a brand new segment we call SEC Story Time. This is the J-Boy Show. Let's win the water cooler. Welcome to the J-Boy Show, hosted by Jake Crane, the fastest growing sports show in the nation. I'm Coach Hugh Freeze. This is Super Bowl champion Brandon Graham. Hey, this is DJ Shockley, and you're watching. And you're watching. So thanks for watching the J Boy Show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for hopping in on another solo edition. That's right. We've gone solo twice this week. Uh, call me Han Solo. Enjoying it. Going to start doing more of it, especially as the season comes on and we finally get plays to break down, analysis, uh, situational things as well. So we're excited you can join us. Speaking, of, speaking about being excited, if you're excited about gambling, all the momentum that's happening, uh, states legalizing it as we look around the country, uh, kind of a new wave of consumer. You need to go to betonline.ag today. The online casino is always open, whether it's Major League Baseball, NBA playoffs that are winding down. The college football season is coming up, uh, and if they play Quidditch, doesn't matter. They're going to have a, a spread for it. The sign-up bonuses are awesome. They're going to play the Sharps as well. That's betonline.ag. Head over there today. And uh, my monologue today is something that gets talked about a lot. Uh, the NCAA enforcement agency with all the stuff coming out about Arizona State, Herm Edwards and that staff, which I don't think they will survive this. They have mountains of evidence, screenshots. Uh, somebody ratted. Somebody turned them in. Uh, they, somebody went Donnie Brasco, uh, sent in something that only a person that was very well connected with the program would have known. Uh, and when you have evidence like this, it's really hard to deny. And the NCAA is moving forward. Even Arizona State spokespeople uh, have said there's an investigation. And look, it's going to get ugly. Uh, it is because it's multiple things happening at once. Uh, but it brings me to a point. And, and look, we live in the real world. Uh, any government uh, type thing, bureaucracy type thing, there's going to be unfair enforcement. And at the NCAA, it, there's a ton of unfair enforcement that goes on. And one of the biggest problems of that organization, outside of being the biggest middleman uh, in the country and, and making more money from doing nothing than any other organization I've ever seen, uh, but you can tell there's tactical enforcement. Uh, even some coaches have spoken out about this from all parts of the country, and I'm not going to say names, but I think we all know uh, when you look at certain places, uh, you have evidence linking people to misgivings or, or undoings or, or cheating, whatever you want to call it, and it doesn't get enforced, or at least it takes such a long time for anything to come to light, it's hard to sit here and say everything is balanced. Arizona State can get hammered. You'll have mid-tier teams get hammered, sometimes for even minor infractions, or drugs through the mud for minor infractions. But here's what I'll say about anything that involves bureaucracy. Follow the money. The schools and organizations that make the most money or that have the most connections, will never get in trouble. They will never get in trouble. And people will say that's not fair, and it isn't fair. But that is the nature of the NCAA. They prioritize who they're going to enforce things on that is going to help the bottom line. And I'm not saying everybody at the NCAA is an evil person or a bad person, but the moniker of that organization is we will treat certain institutions different than other institutions. If you make a certain amount of money in, in uh, you know, relevance and excitement and engagement, they're not going to hit you. They're, they're taking money out of their own pockets. And it doesn't just extend to certain universities. It extends to certain coaches. If you're a certain coach that is super high profile, uh, and you can go down the list. It happens in college basketball. We've seen very recently. It happens in college football. It happens in a lot of different places. If you're a coach of certain stature that brings a certain juice to a sport, or there is an awe or, or, or something around you that is beneficial monetarily for that sport, it's going to take a lot for you to get hit. Man, it's amazing. Ole Miss got hit pretty quick, didn't they? Ole Miss got hit pretty quick, and they cheated. That's the truth. But I promise you, what they did is crumbs compared to what some of these other places do. But you'll never hear about that. And it sends the message. If you want to dance with the big boys and do what some of the big boys do, you better not knock them off their feet. Because if you do, the NCAA is coming for you. 
Now, Arizona State, this is warranted, but it should be treated evenly across the board. And there has been time after time in the major collegiate sports where the NCAA, to quote Kenny Powers, I ain't looking. And they're not. And that's my monologue for today. Hey, I do want to give a shout out to one of our brand new sponsors, Moink Box. Uh, 80% of meat comes from a handful of companies. There is a monopoly on it. Moink Box does it better. Uh, you're not going to get a bunch of cured stuff, a bunch of stuff with a ton of antibiotics in it or just pressed together. This is quality food. You could catch them on Shark Tank where they're said to have the best bacon around. And I promise you, they sent me a box and it had chicken. It had bacon. Uh, it had uh, uh, steaks, tenderloin, everything in it. It's amazing. It's fresh. It tastes good. Uh, they put it in dry ice when they send it to you, and you can literally thaw it and throw it on the grill, and I promise you guys it's great eating. And if you go to moinkbox.com slash believe, that's moinkbox.com slash B-L-E-A-V today, you get free bacon for a year with your first box order. That's right. Free bacon, people. Free bacon. That's what we're offering here. That I feel like the Robin Hood of, of this podcasting game right now. Uh, re- literally free bacon for a year. Moinkbox.com sl- slash believe. And it's great stuff and it's great price. And there are great people that run it. So head to moinkbox.com slash believe and get that free bacon for a year. I do want to move on. Uh, we've been putting out rankings and position groups. And, and it's a lot different when you're looking at quarterback rooms as opposed to running back rooms or wide receiver rooms or DB rooms. Uh, Obviously, one quarterback is going to play 90% of the time unless you have a a situation where you're playing two, and that situation, you really have none. Uh, Very rarely has that instance worked. So when I'm looking at these quarterbacks, I'm looking at the actual individual starter. Uh, And in the SEC, I I don't see how you don't put Matt Corral number one. I've said this multiple times on the show. If you're looking for the best rapport or the best chemistry between a quarterback and an offensive coordinator, and a head coach. It's tough to find a better one than Ole Miss. Uh, it's, uh, they operate in the same pace, in the same wave. Uh, Matt has an unbelievable grasp of that offense, and the combination of Jeff Levy and Lane Kiffin, not only from a game-planning st- standpoint, but from a play-calling standpoint, they transition very easily. D- down in distance to them, uh, they're almost thinking on the same level. You could see that last year. There are a few games, obviously, Matt floated a couple – Uh, Had a few bad ones, but that's human nature. But going into this season, with the amount that Ole Miss is going to throw the ball, and I know they lost Elijah Moore, but they returned Braylon Sanders, a guy I think is going to be all SEC. Uh, Kenny Aboa, Flex Y, a guy that can do many things, a big target. Uh, You look at Jarian Ely, who's a monster out of the backfield, catching the ball. Snoop Connor in the run game. They actually led the SEC in rushing yards per game last year. That's right, Ole Miss did. Now, a lot of that has to do with defenses are playing pass to run and against Lane Kiffin. That's something that uh, you really have to do the way his offense is dictated. But I love the way Matt spins the ball. He's athletic enough to get away from pressure. Uh, We know uh, Ole Miss moved on from their offensive line coach after spring, but he's able to get away from pressure. He's able to extend the play. He's got touch. He can throw the fastball. And he's not afraid to take chances. But he's not super careless. I guess there were some games last year, happens to everybody, uh, where he tried to force some things. But in the flow of the offense, when you can move the pocket, when you can stand in the pocket, when you're a threat to run, when the zone read game can be effective, you can hit on all cylinders. And Ole Miss is going to be a problem on offense this year, and Matt Corral is a big reason why. And that kind of three-headed monster of him, Jeff Levy and Lane Kiffin, are going to cause some problems for some SEC defenses. And then you look at JT Daniel. Uh, JT, a guy that really came on last year, has to stay healthy. I've been saying that. Uh, they add Eric Gilbert, a guy who get, he may be eligible. He may not be eligible. Pickens, is he coming back? Is he not coming back? But they have talent all over that roster. Uh, you look at Darnell Washington at tight end, Karis Jackson at receiver, Blaylock, just go down the list. We know the way Georgia's recruited. But JT Daniels is a savant in, in the pocket. Uh, he really is. He's a football junkie. This guy's going to know exactly what he's going to get. He's not going to be shocked or surprised. He's going to know when he has to get rid of the ball. And when you combine his ability in the pocket, because that's what he is, he's a pro-style passer, with the depth they have at tailback, with the depth they have at receiver, Matt Luke's the offensive line coach. We know the way that they've recruited up front. I think the trust factor between Kirby, and speaking of rapport between head coaches and quarterbacks and OCs, I think having the combination of Todd Munkin and JT Daniels is about to elevate Georgia's offense, not just from a production standpoint, because that's what we look at, 
but the way you attack defenses. JT can attack you on all three levels. He can attack you vertically. He can attack you in, in the intermediate pass game. He can attack you in the quick game, slants, hitches. He can throw the slip screen. So the whole kitchen's open. Uh, and against Clemson, I think you're going to see Georgia be ag aggressive really early uh, on early downs, uh, taking shots down the field to kind of back those safeties up, maybe lighten that box. And then that's when they pound you with the gap scheme run game, get a little bit of zone and, and mix it up out of the backfield. But JT with the weapons around him, with his IQ in the pocket, his understanding of defenses and his ability uh, to just be a natural thrower of the ball from different angles, off platform, he can do that, makes him, in my opinion, the second most deadly quarterback. Now, the third to me, and, and I capped it at three uh, for this reason. The third one, you can go down the list and look. that There's a bunch of different candidates for it. Uh, and I landed on a guy that was a true freshman last year who I think is going to have an unreal college career and a great NFL career. And that's Connor Vasilak. I, I really think Connor last year uh, did really well for a true freshman. Eli Drinkwitz's offense is not an easy thing to run. He's going to mix up formations. He's going to mix you up motionally. Uh, he's going to try and figure out what you're in pre-snap, and that helps. But you have to remember all those things that go into the play, all the checks, all the different formations, and what you're going to get out of certain looks and certain leverages from the defense. And I thought Connor did a really good job and won some big games. I mean, you go back to him last year, you know, uh, people talk about Bo Nix beating Oregon and beating Alabama as a freshman, and, and that's huge. And listen, Bo's in my top five for quarterbacks, and, and people will – Freak out, this, that, and the other. We all know that that Bo Nix, uh, whether he should play or not or whether he's good or not, is a lightning rod of conversation, not only at Auburn but throughout the SEC. But I think Connor Basilak is about to take it to another level this year. Uh, I think there's some momentum in Missouri. I think they got a taste of a little bit of success last year, and you return your gunslinger. And just like I talked about Matt Corral, Connor Basilak's a guy that while he's not going to make the U.S. Olympic sprint team, he's athletic enough to hurt you. He's athletic enough to beat you on the quarterback draw. But I, his arm to me, his arm talent is high, high level. Uh, when, when I watch him be able to throw the sail to the field, be able to throw the corner to the field, be able to throw the whole shot against cover two, uh, to be able to drop it in the bucket on the vertical or on the fade, and that's coming from a freshman. But the one thing about Connor Basilak that I think is his biggest attribute, he thinks he belongs. You watch him play, he does not play shy, he does not play nervous, but he really doesn't play stupid either. Because there's a difference in a guy running around like crazy and making bad decisions because he's scared or he's out of his element. There was a rhyme or reason to everything that Connor did last year. Even when he was having to escape or he was having to scramble, he was making pretty good decisions. And look, you're going to make bad decisions at that position. Seniors make bad positions at that uh, decisions at that position. NFL quarterbacks that have been in the league for 12 years make bad decisions at that position. But I thought his ability, number one, to not be overwhelmed by the moment as a true freshman, and you mix that with the momentum they have, with Eli's mind there offensively, and his ability and the natural fit he is leading a team at quarterback in the SEC. And Connor Basilak is my third best quarterback going into the SEC, on, uh, the SEC season here in 2021. Now look, things could change. Uh, it's always interesting watching a guy go from his freshman to sophomore year because you either go one or two ways, and it's typically on the extreme side. You hear the term sophomore slump and things like that, but uh, I think Eli's going to keep the offense mixed up this year. I don't think they're, they're, the book's going to be out on what Eli's trying to do or what Connor's trying to do, and I'm really excited to see that kid. Uh, I think he's going to have a huge game week two against Kentucky, even though I have Kentucky winning that game. Now, going from one sport to a, and a team in Missouri uh, talking about Connor Basley that's trying to work their way up to another one where a team has dominated a conference and that is John Calipari and Kentucky in basketball and are they losing their grip on the dominance of the SEC and then look this is to me a big storyline there's reports out there that uh you know Calipari is interested in the NBA because there's unreal expectations at Kentucky now, Number one, you've been at Kentucky long enough. You knew what you were signing up for. I mean, it's not like you didn't you uh, you didn't think Kentucky fans were gonna be like, all right, let's go win the NIT. You know, that's that's not what it is. They they consider themselves like Alabama fans consider themselves in football to be uh, the premier program at the top of the mountain. And tradition would tell you that. Now, in reality, though, when I've talked about this on the show, had Todd Lan uh, Lanter, former Kentucky basketball player, talked about this. 
You only got one ship. And a lot of that because Anthony Davis was an alien. You know, we talk about Gene Chizik and Cam Newton and, and that being like a one-hit wonder. And people are saying Ed O and Joe Burrow, whatever, could be a one-hit wonder. Well, with all the talent and ability that Kentucky's had, you win one natty and you had one of the most dominant college players of all time on your team. And I know they've had other runs where, you know, they've gotten close, but I don't think Kentucky fans want close. But if you notice, really in, in the past handful of years, I think SEC basketball, and we've talked about how I think they're going to dominate in the next three to five years and, and become one of the pre premier, if not the premier conferences in college basketball, that comes with the price. And I think Kentucky is going to have to pay that price. I think the days of seeing Kentucky just dominate the regular season or dominate the SEC tournament, I think those days are over. And I know some Kentucky fans, as much love as I've given them in football, they're going to be pissed off at me about this in basketball. I think the run's over. And you say, all right, well, really, what is the run? They're always going to talk about Kentucky basketball when it comes down to the SEC. And in the past, the numbers that Kentucky had put up in the SEC, in their, in their pillar, in their ivory tower, uh, compared to everybody else, that was true. Those are real numbers. But what have they really done lately? I know they've recruited pretty good, but look at last year. Get a couple years in between there. Not a lot of championships. And if you look at the recruiting landscape and you look at the, the level of coaches that are coaching in the SEC right now in college basketball, you could make a very strong case that Kentucky, I wouldn't say, is going to slip down to mediocrity, but there are going to be a three to four to maybe even five teams that are now going to start being talked about in that elite tier group other than just Kentucky and Florida. And the question is, if you're John Calipari, do you want to be the emperor when Rome falls? Do you want to be the one they look back and said, through generation, 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 this king's the one that let us get sacked. This king is the one that kind of got put into a category of many countries now that are dominant instead of being the most dominant. Would you want to stick around for that? That's why I think some of these reports are true. And I'd be shocked if John Calipari was at Kentucky more, to, more than two to three years. And there is going to be a lot of pressure on John Calipari this year. And people say, oh, you have a lifetime contract and this, that, and the other. Well, I can make you this promise. Kentucky can dictate the terms of that lifetime at any point in time. And if you're John Calipari, I don't know if you want to stick around to get put in the tier instead of being the only team in the tier. You look at Auburn. Alabama had a big year last year. We're going to see if they can sustain success. We can see if Nate Oates can do it with players that he's brought in. You lose Herb Jones and stuff like this. But, you know, you look around the league and look at the talent that Tennessee's bringing in. When the, I say the worst coach, but the coach that did the worst is Jerry Stackhouse at Vanderbilt, you know there's a lot of really good coaches in this league. Florida has the ability to be good. I mean, you've seen South Carolina go to a Final Four. Missouri uh, has talent. You look at the league and it is trending toward Kentucky being another really good team in the SEC as opposed to being the only elite team in the SEC. And gone are the days where the SEC has to just hope Kentucky is good to have a chance to win a national championship. Hey, I do want to give a shout out to Dynasty U, the LinkedIn of recruiting. If your child uh, or you're the prospect or guardian or whatever is trying to get seen by colleges, you need to download the Dynasty U app right now from Google Play Store, anywhere you get your apps. This thing, it's, it's a brilliant idea. It's concise because coaches don't want to go through 10,000 emails looking about how great your son or daughter is and this, that, and the other. And, and uh, they sold a bunch of kites to a bunch of kids and stuff like that. They want to have it all in one place, uh, be able to see the grades, social media, uh, stuff like that, articles about your kid. It's, it's really, really easy to navigate and it makes it a whole lot easier on college coaches which makes it a whole lot easier to get your kids seen. Now, it doesn't guarantee a scholarship. They have to earn that on and off the field. But if you don't download the Dynasty U app right now, you're already going to be behind. You're not going to be efficient. And it's totally free. So download the Dynasty U app right now from the Google Play Store or anywhere that you get your apps. Now, we've hit college football. I'm going to hit that one more time here at the end. We've hit college basketball. But ladies and gentlemen, we have the College World Series kicking off tomorrow. And I've had a bunch of people ask me, message me, uh, that have Barstool Sportsbook. Shout out Mincy, shout out El Presidente, uh, Portnoy, Big Cat, uh, Coach Duggs, 
uh, squirming around somewhere. But the College World Series, and, and I lived in Council Bluffs, Iowa for two years, which is right across the water from Omaha. Omaha is an awesome place. College World Series, went to it twice, was an unbelievable experience uh, from the bars on the outside to the games on the inside. Uh, it's just a great atmosphere, and it's, it's a great event. And excited to see and excited to see the fans there. Uh, that's what I'm really excited about. But when handicapping, who's going to win the College World Series? I'm looking at the numbers. And I'm going off Barstool Sportsbook. They're one of the only ones that offer this. I've got Stanford plus 800. And it's funny, uh, Stanford has gotten hot. They're playing well. Uh, but they decided to wear black, I believe, in game two against Texas Tech in 106 degree heat because the starting pitcher that day stood up before the game and said, I want to wear black because we're going to Texas Tech's funeral. I like that. I believe in that. I think Stanford, uh, the Palo Alto boys, are a little bit pissed off going into this thing. And listen, Tennessee, I understand that pick. They've been hot. Interested to see how they play in that park, how their bats translate from the park they've been playing in to this one. You know, not saying you can't get doubles in the gap and stuff like that, but the dimensions are a little bit different out there at Rosenblatt. Uh, than they are where Tennessee plays. So I'm interested to see them. Uh, but plus 800 on Stanford, I like that pick. Uh, called Medina Spirit, called obviously the national champion, uh, champion of football last year and Baylor in college basketball this year. So we've been hot when it comes down to champions. And in this tournament, I'm taking Stanford because I think it's a good bet, plus 800. Uh, Vandy as well, Jack Leiter is, is pumping more gas than the Nord Stream 2 right now. Uh, and uh, Kumar Rocker, we know what he is. We know we've watched him, we've watched him do it. Uh, at the highest level. I just wonder, Vandy's kind of had a little bit of up and down uh, and, and past those two guys are they going to be able to put it together. But I'm taking Stanford plus 800. And, and you know, something you've seen, and Mincy's done a good job of this, uh, Brandon Walker, huh, now because Mississippi State's in it, uh, has kind of tried to take the grow the game moniker. But if you're somebody that ha doesn't watch college baseball or hasn't, I challenge you to tune in for one of these games in Omaha. If you caught some of the regional action, I mean, it is, it's really intense. And I know people say, oh, baseball's boring to watch and this, that, and the other. This is a little bit different. And if you're a little apprehensive going into it, just watch one of the games. And I promise you, you're going to get locked in on it at some point. Uh, and it's going to get tense. And, and these guys have been dreaming about this moment their whole lives. Everything's on the line. And you see a lot of mistakes. I mean, you can go back to Auburn and, and Edouard Julian against Mississippi State. Routine ground ball to third. Just step and throw, man. Just step and throw, but pat, pat, sail, and you lose the game. So it comes down to inches, small things within the game. Uh, so I challenge you to watch that, but I'm taking Stanford plus 800. Something, too, that, that I've said on the radio, if you follow, you know, and, and again, I feel like I'm on the radio 300,000 times, but it's great. I enjoy doing it and, and work with some really great people. I get the question all the time. How's this coach going to do year one? Or what is, from a play-calling standpoint, what can a coach do if you don't have your players in there? And my short answer is, you have to adjust to your personnel early. Had Jeff Collins, head coach of Georgia Tech on. He had to inherit a roster that was built for the triple option. They had like 10 running backs on scholarship, something ridiculous. And when you run that type of offense, I mean, that makes sense. But when you get to a place and, and they have players that are built for a certain system, not as drastic as triple option to spread, but when you have a roster that is built for a certain type of offense and you're bringing in even a slightly different at a few position offense, uh, you have to be able to adjust to the personnel that you have. And I know you have the portal and you can bring in guys and, and you, know, you start recruiting and you have some guys coming in the summer but you really have what you have and you can't try and fit a square peg into a round hole. And one of the worst decisions a first year head coach can make is go in there and say, regardless of the roster, we're going to run it this way because this is the way I want to run it. Even if the players aren't comfortable for it, because you have to understand you have cycles to recruit guys that fit what you want to do. You can go out on the trail in the next class and the class after that, and the class after that, and bring in 25, 25, 25, and now you look at the roster and it's filled with guys that can do what you need them to do for that certain position. But you don't have that ability totally in your first year. So if you look at a guy like Shane Beamer, you look at a guy like Josh Heupel, Brian Harson, Clark Lee, the smart decision is to take what you want to do from an identity standpoint and blend that with what your players do best 
for that first season. And I think that's why sometimes you'll see coaches that go into a place in their first year and teams will watch tape on where they've been, the, the places they've coached and the games they've coached in and how they run their offense or how they run their defense or how they run their team and formulate a game plan off that because you have to. But when you go into a new place and you have to tweak what you normally do because the personnel's different, you tend to catch people by surprise. And that leads to winning games sometimes that people did not think you were going to win year one. Because just game planning is just like war in a sense, not in the killing. But that the best tool is surprise. If you can surprise your enemy or your opponent, you have a chance to make bigger plays or get bigger things accomplished. So in this first year with these new coaches, if you're watching this offense and you've done your due diligence and you're like, man, this looks a little bit different than what we've seen from these head coaches at other places, it's because they're smart and it is. Now, will that offense be the same two years down the road from a play calling and game planning standpoint? No, and smart coaches always evolve. But if you go into a program and you try and fit a square peg into a round hole from a personnel standpoint, you are going to start off on a bad foot. And it's really tough to go and convince. Re it's a little bit easier before you've played a game when you come in and you have new facilities being built or something and you tell them the vision and you're selling the vision. This is who we're going to be. We're back. We're going to get back to that mountaintop. And then you go five and seven or four and eight. Tough to go in that room and be like, I told you, look at that, four wins. We may get six next year, and then eight after that. And by the time you're a junior, hell, we may go to a New Year's game bowl. These kids don't want to hear that. So going out there and doing something early, even if it's winning a couple games or one game against a big opponent, you shouldn't. That's the momentum that you need. Seven, eight wins going in and say, look, I told you we're building this. Look who we just beat. And we don't even have our guys in yet. We don't have you in yet. Guys that we know we can win the whole thing with. Guys like you. So that is a huge thing for year one coaches. So when you're watching your team's offenses or you're watching your teams in general this year and you're seeing things that may be a little bit different than what Shane Beamer saw at Oklahoma, maybe a little bit different than what Brian Harson did at Boise, know that that's because these coaches are smart and they're not stubborn. Will any of them be stubborn? I can take a guess on which one will, but I'm not going to say it out here because I don't think he's changing the way he does things. But just keep an eye on that. And remember, I told you. Now, last thing before we get out of here today, uh, you know, I'm, I was very fortunate growing up under a guy that was all SEC, all American linebacker and, and coached and played in the league and coached uh, in the SEC for a while. I got to hear some great stories not only from his playing days, uh, but from other guys uh, that you really wouldn't hear unless you were in that room. And some of them I can't tell, I can never tell, but a few of them I can. Uh, and th this one may gross a couple people out, but this is just how it is. So my father was telling me one time they were playing Georgia, he played at Auburn. And you know he didn't even tell me the year if it was 86 or 87. I know there's gonna be people out there that remember this play, but it was a close game late in the game. Georgia had taken out their starting quarterback and put in a guy that was kind of dual threat, uh, a guy that could run a little bit. Uh, the game was winding down. My father played middle linebacker. And one more stop wins the game, or pretty much ices it. So he's playing linebacker. Ball snap, sees pass, he drops. All of a sudden, the quarterback takes off. I can't remember if he said he got a first down. He was close to getting a first down. Kind of a big hit, and there was a pile. And the quarterback was on the bottom of the pile. Bunch of guys on top from both teams. My father was on the bottom of the pile as well. Now, this was in 86 or in 87, like I said, and he didn't play with the mouthpiece. I know as crazy as that sounds, nowadays with all the stuff coming out, he did not play with the mouthpiece. And he's at the bottom of the pile, and he's right next to the quarterback, and somebody's hand had, like, knocked his helmet up. Well, you have to understand, nobody can see under this pile and the quarterback is on the ground and has the ball in his hand like this. My father's face and his face mask is up right by his arm. And just instinctually, my father sees the ball, plays over, and takes a huge bite 
out of the Georgia quarterbacks are a huge bite to where he said when he looked back, you could almost see the bone in the arm of the quarterback. So what does the guy do? He screams and he drops the ball at the bottom of the pile. So what does my dad do? He grabs the ball, worms his way out of the pile. The referee is standing right there. He looks at the ref and still has this dude's arm meat in his mouth, blood on his face, spits it down. It hits part of the ref. He shows him the ball. The referee freaks out, looks Auburn's way and points and gives Auburn the ball. And Auburn wins the game. That is a true story. I don't know if that story has ever been told, but he said the quarterback got up and was looking at the ref and showing him the chunk of meat that my father had bitten out of his arm to get the ball. Now that right there is what we call a forced turnover. I'm gonna start calling this segment SEC story time. I got a great one for the next solo show. I'm sure I'll get a lot of uh, happy Georgia fans about that. And I know a lot of you probably remember that game, uh, but that was a story that used to get talked about all the time. Uh, and I find while it's, I guess you could say gross, look, you know, what happens in the pile stays in the pile, especially at the bottom of the pile. We appreciate you guys joining us. Make sure you go to thejboyshow.com, grab some merchandise, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube as well. Go subscribe to that YouTube channel. We've got great content coming and we're going to simulcast during the season so you can watch the game, turn the volume down, and I'm going to tell you what's going on and most likely what is going to happen, good, bad, or indifferent, and you can ask questions. It's going to be huge, but tell your friends. But we appreciate you guys. And like a chunk of our meat from a Georgia quarterback at the bottom of the pile, we're going, going, gone. The J-Boy Show is produced by David Cohn, Technical Director Dave Hammock, Creative Director David Culbertson, Audio Engineer Faison Sharif, Production Assistants Blaine Crane and Kyle Orr, Executive Producers Jake Crane, Vince Thompson, Steve Chamberlain, and David Cohn. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, thejboyshow.com, for updates regarding our newest apparel and merch designs. When the water cooler with the J-Boy Show.